This podcast episode is brought to you by Pentair. For episode 50 today, we will be continuing our architectural series. In honor of St. Patrick's Day, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Paul McLean and Bernardo Boras from McLean Design. Growing up in Dublin, Paul McLean always knew that he wanted to design houses. McLean Design's client list is a who's who of Hollywood elite. Stay tuned as we learn how they uniquely utilize water and light to transform their projects into warm and delightful living spaces. Hello and welcome to the show today. My name is Dave Penton from Fluid Dynamics Pool and Spa, and I have the distinct honor today of interviewing Bernardo and Paul from the Southern California-based architecture firm, McLean Design. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks Thank you, Dave. Good morning. So, as our listeners um, may think it's a little weird uh, that we're a show based around water and everything, and why would we have an architect on? Uh, and so one of the things that I have enjoyed uh, in, in looking at your work is that water is such an integral part of, of everything that you design. It's not just the typical swimming pool by others in the backyard. Um, you know, you guys really seem to try to integrate water in with your architecture inside the house, outside the house. Um, you know, it, it really seems to be um, one of the elements that you really design into the projects. It's not just a, um, it's not just a, a, a bolt-on, if you will. Uh, and so um, I'd love to get into a little bit of that, uh, but just also want to, uh, for the four people that might not know you that are listening. Uh, the four it, listeners, you mean. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, get to know you a little bit, uh, where you came from. I mean, uh, uh, from Dublin through Laguna Beach and, and now into Hollywood Hills. I just want to kind of uh, learn more about who is Paul. Right. Um, Paul McLean, and I grew up in Dublin. Uh, I've been here for about 25 years now, so that keeps makes me half my life in California and half wow. my life in Dublin. So I'm not sure where I identify completely with anymore, but I still got an accent, so that's a clue. Um, so I grew up, I, I always wanted to be an architect since I was a very little boy, since about four or five years old. And uh, when I was growing up, I always was mostly interested in residential design and that hasn't really changed um, and I came here mainly because I, I felt like and I still feel like Los Angeles uh, Southern California is probably the epicenter of residential design in in the world and, and and it's a place where you see real innovation that then follows on into other places from there so uh, I was very interested in coming here I uh, worked for a couple of architects for about five years after I got here and then set up McLean Design in 2000 and we've been going strong since and Bernardo, who's sitting with me, has been, well, we've been waiting for over 10 years now, right? 10 years now. Oh, 10 years. I've been up with you for 10 years. Wow, that's impressive. I've been part. with you longer than my wife. That's true. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm easier to get on with. You are. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little about yourself, then? Well, pretty much raised in California my entire life since I was one, and uh, don't know anything else except for the California lifestyle. And since you know graduating high school, I always knew that this was my direction to go into architecture. Really? And so that's uh, both of you had that from a very young age. That's really cool. It's like the priesthood. It's a calling. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to Paul, you know, I knew early, but I was kind of one of those kids that wasn't ready to go into the career world and just took my time. But when I was ready, that's where I was really focused on. It was architecture. And before joining the Clean Design, I worked for a few firms you know for a handful of years and then finally found this firm and the architecture it's really what's uh, focused me on moving forward in the architecture is like the, the language that we're trying to perceive and express to you know people around us so it's it's flattering to be part of this company that's grown so much in the last 10 years he's yeah, looking for a pay raise <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a uh, you know I come from kind of just blue collar roots myself. Me and, too. And I'm just a you I'm too, just a right? blue guy. Yeah. Um, you know and and uh, um, you know I like you find myself uh, in on some of these really high profile jobs. Sometimes I just walk in and pinch myself. It's like 
how did a normal kid, you know, from a normal neighborhood end up here? I mean, it's just such a, uh, I love, that's one of the things that I really enjoy the most about what I do. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's really cool. So um, did you both, uh, what's your background? I mean, architecture, but, uh, you know, did you start designing drawing? Um, I, I read that you're really good uh, with pencil and, <laughs> and all of that. Uh, is that, was that uh, kind of just a love of art or did, was it always just uh, drawing buildings and architecture and, and doing that growing up? Dave, I almost got thrown out of my art class in high school because oh, all wow. I would do was draw buildings all day long, <laughs> you know. And I would say, "Well, you can just draw this the the nice lady sitting in front of us. You took her clothes off. Will you draw her?" And I'm like, "I gotta draw this building, though." You know. So, no, I just uh, I was just love drawing houses I, from like from being a tiny kid. My mom said that uh, the first clue was I didn't put the windows in the corner of the sketch, you know, the way the mm. other kids did. I had them proper and proper doors and so on. So, um, I I just always was fascinated with. Uh, architecture and drawings and I came come like yourself come from a very modest background and never really imagined that we would end up in this situation and and have these type of clients we do these type of houses uh, it was not something that we set off with a plan to do it just sure. kind of evolved and uh, I think we started off doing homes in in Laguna Beach and there's a design review board there so there's a lot of uh, talking and negotiation and as, as Joe Biden says us Irish are good at talking that's <laughs> one of our we're not good at cooking we're good at talking <laughs> and um, so I, I got a reputation for being able to negotiate with neighbors and the board and so on and and that actually led to to more and more work and and then sometime in the, in the mid 2000s we had a client who had a project that they wanted us to do up in in Hollywood and uh, when the big recession happened, we were just finishing that project, and he unfortunately had to sell it, but it sold for a lot of money, and that just got us a bit of an instant reputation there. So, so since then, we've really concentrated on, on doing homes. Our, our, the bulk of our work is now in Los Angeles um, okay. and, uh, and on beyond at this stage. You know? but, uh, but going back, I mean, it's really about the drawing in the end. That's where it started, and it's still, for me, it's still about drawing and, and thinking of ideas and also just communication with people and and uh, we really do enjoy our clients and we, we we're very they're very interesting people we mostly have people who've done something interesting with their life and that's how they got to be as successful as they are and as we know you need to be successful if you're going to build a house like this and uh, the other good thing is people are they they're not in a bad point in their life when they're doing what they do with us they're usually happy sure. and they're usually feel optimistic and, and that feeds into the project. I mean, you wouldn't be starting a project if you're in the middle of a nasty divorce or something, you know? So uh, it makes for a very positive work environment, I think, despite the complexities. Yeah, okay. Now, how about you, Bernardo? Is that, uh, d did you come up drawing and, and that as well? Came up drawing, playing with Legos, all the things that, you know, little kids do when they start. And then it was really my high school drafting teacher mm. who was a former, gangbanger that just really set us straight and focused on certain things but seeing him and as, as an example of how he can change his life into something like this and then you know sharing his creativity beyond what his past was you know what he did in the past was uh was very good for these kids you know for my, myself as well but um because of that it sort of spearheaded me into this direction with architecture and then from there it was more focused on you know architecture and more than just drawing it was more uh, reading spaces and you know uh, just uh, being more creative with structures and stuff like that but um, like Paul was saying you know we're very fortunate with the clients that we have and then starting from you know the modest little homes to now the mega mansions that we work with and and design and it's it's incredible what we're able to do with uh, and, and sharing this and the joy that we see in our clients' eyes when we do give them the keys at the end and they do, then they do move in. Yeah. So it's uh, special. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I really enjoy is just uh, you know we we deal with water and so um, you know the 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 way I like to explain what I do is is we build people's dreams. And you know, it's it's uh, backyards and and water elements in the pool. It, it's it's people enjoy to use those spaces, uh, and and we're 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 creating family time, and we're creating relationship, and we're really uh, we're really. Uh, it, it's one of the things that I love the most is just being able to be a part of projects where 
where we know how it's going to be used. And, and uh, so I, I love that. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about some of your uh, architectural influences. Um, you know, when did you start to become aware of, you know, different architectural styles? Did you always gravitate towards kind of modern contemporary? Uh, did you dabble around in other areas? Where, uh, how did you come to be where you're at now? Um, I think I can remember, I think it was, you know, back in when I was 10, there wasn't any, obviously, any Internet. And uh, it was the local library. And obviously, it was a, a suburban library in Dublin. So it didn't really have a big architecture section, probably about five books. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do remember the first book I, I saw was a Frank Lloyd Wright book. And uh, he had, and of course, the first house in the, in the it was Falling Water, which is we all know about. Um, and I, I was completely perplexed by it at first. I couldn't really see why that was a house. That was <laughs> when I was 10. And um, so I, I really was fascinated with that. I've only, only been interested in contemporary architecture, uh, international style through to today. I think I was, when I got to college, I discovered all the case study houses in Los Angeles. And, and that's, a, for those who, who don't know about it, it's a really interesting program where architects try to design houses for uh, regular families after the war. That was the concept behind it. Of course, today the ones that we have are all sitting up in the Hollywood Hills and are probably well beyond most people. But, right. But at the the concept behind it was to introduce modern homes to to the general public, especially in that post-war period where there's a lot of people moving to California and to try and take it in that direction. So that was so I I was always fascinated, like I said, with with residential architecture and uh, I love the work in Neutra. Um, I, I'm not so, so much of a Schindler fan as I am a Neutra fan, but okay. I think I like the, it's interesting those two are always, you know, two of the bigger names in Southern California, but uh, I like the clean lines that Neutra did. So th that's part of what pulled me to Los Angeles in the first place was uh, that style of architecture. So for me, it's just always just been that I never understood the postmodernism movement in the 80s and 90s or, uh, you know, and or replication, I always felt like. I think people get sidetracked by that, by, by the pastiche of what it looks like, when really what, you know, they're often looking for is when they look back at old towns and cities and that they find so attractive, like we have in Europe or on the East Coast of America, it's really the scale and the, the pedestrian nature of them and uh, the scale of the streets. Those are the things that people, you know, are attracted to. But often, the, you know, what we get is people making pastiche of those buildings mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to reinterpret that in a style more appropriate for today. For myself, it was a little different because I was trained to learn how to put traditional homes together. Okay. And uh, and then that's what we see in Orange County is you know everything is controlled by architectural like, review boards, architectural and review board, boards, HOAs or, or and the Irvine Company type of style homes, and that's what I you know and this is the California look is these concrete shingles and and that uh, and and smaller windows and just arches and and corbels, and then you know I learned to not like that mm. by being in you know. In, in working with it, so then you know, trans, transmitting into what I start when I started working with Paul, it's I started appreciating and enjoying and liking the modern architecture more. Seeing like what the simple forms and the simple spaces creates more than what these other traditional homes were offering, and uh, there was limitations in traditional homes that I saw that modern homes didn't have. And there is more uh, expression that you can, you can you can give to a modern home than you could with a traditional home. So, you know, in comparing the two, I just felt like you know modern homes is is a better architecture for me in in preference. But uh, again, you know, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't go through the whole steps of being trained in the other way. Sure, and and uh, especially down here in Orange County. Um, where we're recording today, um, a lot of Spanish colonial, um, which is very, uh, it's 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 a definite design style, but it's very enclosed. You know, you've got uh, you've got art, small windows, small arches, and and everything. And you know, one of the things I love about your guys' work is that um, you're. You, it's the epitome, it's like the complete opposite of that. You know, everything is open, free-flowing spaces and, and bringing the inside out and the outside in. And um, 
you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, international style of that, you know, let's not have walls segmenting everything and, and just the ability for the whole space to be um, kind of reimagined as more of, you know, not, not isolated rooms. Like we're, we go to this room to, you know, read the paper and we go to this room here. And so, um, you know, it's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about, uh, you know, seeing all of your projects and being on your projects is that, um, you know, they are wide open. And, and uh, so talk a little bit about that and, and how you um, kind of achieve that. Um, and, and the other, one more thing too that I'd love you to, to touch on is how do you, contemporary design can be very, very cold. And I, I never have gotten that feeling in your projects. How do you keep that warm and open and, and indoor and outdoor? Well, I think it, it comes in some ways from, from the place we're in and starting with the climate. And um, I, I think if you go back in, in history, I mean, the, the modern architecture that we think of the international style grew out of a desire, like they looked at people that were living often in slums and unsanitary conditions. And it was about making a new start that was more about actually quite an emphasis on health and that connection to nature. And um, I think we, we have this, uh, this climate that we live in here in Southern California is probably, I, I mean, I think we can all agree it's probably the best climate in the world for day-to-day -day living. I mean, the, the temperature is ver barely fluctuates and uh, it's always pretty much a nice warm climate. You can be outdoors pretty much every day of the year. And someone coming from somewhere like Ireland where it rains a lot and it's cold, that, that's enormously attractive. So for me, when I came here, it, it was all about connection to nature. And, and I think that's one thing that also the topography of Los Angeles or greater Southern California lends itself to, that it's there's so many mountains and the sea and the, there's great opportunity to, to connect with nature or connect with views of the city or connect with views of the ocean. So that's our starting point is often about view and how can we connect with nature. And even if we're working on a flat lot, you know, we still have the opportunity to, to look at nature and how can we connect the inside. And I think that actually by itself adds a lot of warmth to the project. So we try that the house does not get in the way mm. of uh, interacting with its environment. Um, and obviously we have the technology today to, to be able to take these designs and make them work and hopefully make them waterproof. And uh, we can do things with glass that were not possible 20, 30 years ago. So we can have walls of glass that move by themselves out of the way and uh, make it possible for people to, to live indoors and outdoors. The fir first house we did for a lady called Patty Civic was in Laguna Canyon. And the, her living room was just basically a giant box, but one wall completely opened. And she said every morning, the first thing she does is she opens that wall up completely, no matter wow. what the weather is. And uh, so she's always aware of her, her, her environment. And um, I think in the materiality helps as well. We try and use soft natural materials where we can, though that often comes down to what the client wants. Sure. Um, but, but again, if, if the house doesn't get in the way of the view or doesn't get in the way of nature and the materials are soft, it can be warm and inviting at the same time as being very contemporary. Exactly what Paul said. <laughs> <laughs> you are looking for a raise, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> no, he summed it up because if the house is there, then how can you appreciate what's on the other side of these walls. If they were enclosed with, you know, going back to the traditional homes, you can't enjoy or be part of the environment if you have a barrier between you. And for us, it's more just the, the inside outside appreciation of one another and just, in, you know, opening up and bringing the environment into the interior. That's pretty much how our homes are relating to these people who are using them. They don't see a barrier where the glass is and this is the end of your home. It continues beyond that. So your home extends to the rear yard, to the, to the ends of your property. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't end at the, at the rear wall or at the rear door, mm -hmm. you know, it continues on. So I found this quote and, and I, I wanna, uh, I, I, I love this quote as a water guy. Uh, and so uh, you were quoted as saying, we think that water changes the atmosphere and it makes people slow down. So uh, I, I'd love to get your understanding of how and why you integrate water and, and how do you use it to change moods and to uh, transition between spaces and that. 
That's a, a great question. Um, and, and, and a long answer probably coming up. <laughs> Obviously, starts off with growing up in a very wet place, you know, living in the desert, you know, <laughs> it's like, yes. um, you know, missing the water. No, but I think that if you go back and look at, I mean, obviously many people have lived in arid climates for millennia. And uh, think about the focus of water in those ancient societies. I mean, even starting in Mesopotamia when they grew up between the two rivers, that's where our civilization essentially began. Mm -hmm. And if you look back at, you know, architecture in the Arab world or um, like the in southern Spain is always a water component. And I think it's because water is obviously uh, the, the major component of life for us. We have to breathe, we need water, we need food, uh, we need moisture in our bodies to make them work. It's essential for life. Life can't exist without water. So water needs to be an integral part of our lives. And we are in an arid climate, so that makes me at least more aware of that. Um, so there's a lot of ways we use water, but I, I think that starting with that, the desert climate, uh, introducing water to, to remind people of that and make them feel comfortable, make them feel refreshed. Um, we can use water in different ways. Like we, we use water sometimes to slow people down at an entrance to make them realize they're leaving <coughs> the urban environment or you know, they're coming home, they're, they're coming to retreat. Uh, mm -hmm. People associate water with calmness, so um, the idea of crossing water to get into your house is a way of just making you, making you stop and think. I mean, I have um, at my when I leave my car and I have to cross a water feature to get to my front door, and the stepping stones, you know, they're they're deliberately a certain size so that you have to slow down. You know, you can't just race across them because otherwise you'll trip and fall in the water. You know, which is, <laughs> but it's intentional to make you kind of realize that you're coming from one thing and moving into another. So that's that's one way we use water. Um, we often use water as well as a, as a mirror. You know, because uh, mm. these pools work fa fabulously for reflecting the sky, reflecting the, the lights at nighttime, um, and that's a that's a beautiful thing. And we use water as as a deliberate barrier. So we'll use a water feature to stop people from getting to a certain point on the lot. So the water keeps them further back and it helps us edit and control the view. So you may be looking out at a cityscape or a beautiful view of nature. You may not realize there's a house right below you because the water is stopping you from getting to that point where you can see the house. Mm. Um, and then another another way we use water is to cool. So <clears throat> if you if you put water on next to a room um, and the wind blows over it, some of that moisture will come in. So it's like a natural cooling. And people have been doing that for like thousands of years, much yeah, more exactly. successfully than we do, you know, but uh, there's a lot of history to that. And I think people forget that the advantage of it. And then a last point for now is uh, the, the appearance of light reflected uh, through water. So you, if, when, when light bounces off and refracts off water, it reflects differently than it does off a hard surface. And you can get that appearance of dappled light in a room, which can be very calming for people, almost poetic. Here's a quick word from Pinter. I want to kind of get into more of the pumps, uh, you know, the variable speed pumps, the variable flow pumps, you know, when they first came out, I think it was like 2005 or 2006, they were like a pretty, it was a huge leap in, in pump technology. Uh, I know other industries had had it around for a little bit before the, the pool industry, before you guys got into it, but you guys were the first ones that came out with it. And I think that really just changed the whole dynamic of energy efficiency. Um, so the great thing about the variable speed pumps is you can do multiple things with the same pump. Um, so kind of get into that. Uh, what, what do most people use those variable speed pumps for? I use them on everything, whether it's my main filtration pump or water feature pumps. I rarely ever buy a single speed pump anymore. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Those are, those are, you have a lot of good questions there. So the variable speed flow pump technology, which started back in 2005, the whole idea behind it at the time was that they were, when they would have a pool and a spa, they would always, on that spa, sometimes it was a single pump system. So we had to have two horsepower pumps running seven days a week just to filter, right. to wait for the homeowner to come home and use the spa. So that's a huge energy uh, kill on the system because it's gonna eat up a lot of energy at, at, uh, at a two horsepower pump just for filtering when all we need is about 32 to 35 gallons a minute. If, if this right. vessel is hydraulically plumbed well. Right, correct, yeah. And that's a big if. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back in the day, it used right. to be all inch and a half, and right. to get the industry to go to two was a big chore, and right. now we want two and a half and three. Right. So it's, it, and the nice thing about the variable speed pumps or variable speed flow, you know, the whole vessel's based on flow. The, so the cleaners are based on how much flow is going to go in order for it to operate. 
The same for uh, the skimmers. We want to X amount of flow across the weir of that skimmer to surface, pull all of the surface dirt off of the vessel so that the cleaner doesn't have to work as hard uh, below the, uh, the water level. Right. So that uh, the, the pumps made a big difference that we were able to set the gallons per minute or the RPMs to facilitate how well that that vessel is going to be, uh, be, be op uh, operated at. Right. So when you look at every motor in the swimming pool business, whether it's a half horsepower or all the way up to a three horsepower, is 3,450, 3,450 RPMs. Every motor is the same. Right? Yeah, the great thing about uh, the efficiency of those variable, you know, speed pumps and the, and the variable flow pumps is that uh, you know you can you can get that sweet spot, you know, on the variable speed where you know I do a lot of water and transit things, whether they're like overflows or or negative edges or just like if I'm doing a fountain that really needs to have a unique speed on it. You know, with all with the plumbing sizes that I do. Now you mentioned something about you know two and a half and three inch. I like uh, anything. I don't like anything less than th three inch. You know, I do a lot of four inch and uh, six inch so I like to I love to play around with it when I start up uh, you know a pool like we have a lot of water and transit like overflow edges and I just love to sit there and play with that pump a little bit and just dial down that perfect speed to make the water you know flow over you know on all on all sides at the lowest possible speed you know for the most efficiency I get a real thrill when I see the wattage you know that's being used and it's like oh well this is no more than a you know than a lamp you know in, in, inside the house so absolutely I, I tell you that that pump is a game changer all the way through given that every vessel that's ever been built and will be built in the future that it's a snowflake I mean it's it's, it's as different as a snowflake and the plumbing is as anything could be out there and that pump can adapt to whatever it needs to be so that means you can change those gallons per minute to facilitate whatever that event needs to happen on how that event needs to look so with especially with uh, with IntelliCenter now and a new digital valve operator it allows us to set up for, with one pump multiple speeds are flows that will facilitate that look of different water features and bubblers or vanishing edge all with the push of a button that the analytics are built into it that when you push that button it automatically facilitates that to happen and with the flow especially with the flow that if you say you have to have 40 gallons a minute as the filter gets dirtier and dirtier it will increase the rpms to make sure that the flow stays consistent Right, and that's a great thing, especially for consumers that sometimes take care of their own pools or even some uh, guys that don't really clean the filter as much as they should. <laughs> yes. um, you know, that works out really well to keep up that maintain of that flow. So, um, you know, the great thing I also like about the variable speed pump is you guys have come out with like smaller models of them. So they don't always have to be like 220 gallons a minute or 160 gallons a minute. You know, like with the I-1 pump, it's 120 gallons a minute. So if you have an older pool that, you know, had that one inch and a half plumbing on it, you can actually buy that uh, I-1 and actually you find that sweet spot you know toward the hydraulics will actually work better because you're able to put a pump on that more matchly sizes the size sure. of the hydraulics sure. and uh, you know that's a lot with the safety factors too because mm -hmm. you know unfortunately line velocity if you have a big pump on there like the two horsepower pumps that we all used to put on you know prior to the variable speeds coming out um, you know that line velocity was pretty incredible on a two inch line if you're putting a two horse whisper flow on there so we're able to really get more safe and that we can you know we can find that sweet spot that's speed and lock it in you know so our main drains uh you know especially on older pools that don't get renovated so our main drains are safer and uh, our line velocities we can slow those way down so and under new construction when you really need massive amount of water flow you got the xf sure and and just the the interplay of light and water and and you know, do, do you want the water perfectly smooth, you know, and, and you're going to get uh, some refraction with, with smooth water and a very different, uh, you know, as opposed if you introduce some movement into the water right. and you get that kind of dancing effect. So you can really, um, so talk a little bit too about lighting and water and, and how does, how do you envision, because a, uh, a pool at night versus a pool in the day or, or even any type of waterscape, um, uh, it, they become different elements and, and they're almost like uh, completely unique depending on whether it's night or day. Well, water walls, for example, is a backdrop and it's a terminus if you were looking down a corridor or it's like an art piece. So it accentuates uh, 
you know, the, the space where it ends and frames it and allows you to focus on a water feature that's cascading down. And um, similar to the project we worked with you on in Bel Air, uh, we have this long water feature during the day. You know, it's really nice to provide the sound that you can buffer from the street noise. And at night, it allows you to have this pretty entrance and it guides you from one point the starting point for the motor core it leads you to the entry so with the the water feature being lit then it allows you just you know to start from one area and takes you to this journey towards the front door so um, lighting is a key factor in water features and why can't why shouldn't you not enjoy the water feature all the time exactly. whether it's during the day or at night and um, and you know it's it's really just here is your water feature that uh, that that's used and you just want to you know really enjoy it all the time yeah now one of the challenges that I see as as a, a contractor building these is just that um, a lot of them are, are fairly complex uh, and and though they look simple and that uh, it, it's their um, the integration uh, can sometimes be hard uh, and can you talk a little bit about some of the frustrations that you guys so I backing up a little bit i feel like um you guys are the artists and it's my job to bring your vision to life and um i, I in talking with previous architects um i know that that's a challenge and and a lot of times um you guys don't feel like we've captured uh, exactly what you want and so can you talk a little bit about that and what you would like to see from uh you know from from those of us out in the field putting these together for you well, I mean, <clears throat> one thing we, we in our office we're, we're very, very aware of is that you know, we, we don't operate in a, vi in a vacuum. And um, <clears throat> we're not believers in, in going around and telling people what to do. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, Dave. Like what, what we want to, to have with our relationship with someone like you is to be able to say this is our intent. Uh, how, do we, how do we achieve that intent? And be, being fully aware that you, you know a lot more about how, how to put that vision together than we actually do. We may, may have an idea or a vision of what that should be, but we need people to help us achieve that. And so I think, obviously, communication is key to everything. Um, I think often architects make mistake of trying to dictate how things should be put together. Um, when they don't really have the knowledge, I mean, we, we, we have a lot. We have a lot of areas where we're kind of at a, at a level. It's like a high concept level, and <clears throat> I guess in the old days, the architect was responsible for everything. But projects have grown so vast and so complex that we're just one of the team players here. But we still have to. I think part of our role is to to be the person that guides the project forward, so that all the ideas and and the great ideas we're getting from everybody can be you know, combined into something beautiful. Um, as you know, if a lot of people are just talking at the same time or, or coming up with different ideas, it can, go on, it can go just sideways really quickly. So our focus is to try and stir the ship in one direction, right? But try and take all of everyone else's expertise and, and, and create the value we need there. Um, I think that, uh, again, communication back and forth, you know, I think sometimes what goes wrong is that architect has an idea, builder or subcontractor starts to build it, then it comes back later that it doesn't work the way the mm. intent was. I mean, we all need to try and communicate earlier because uh, I think that if we could do that, we could find ways to maybe make the idea work better versus sure. just waiting until you're out in the field and it's half built and you saying, this doesn't work, Paul, what do you want to do? And you're like, Ugh, let's compromise with this. Mm. If we had that conversation way earlier, there might have been a way to achieve the original goal that we just didn't see. And uh, often people, get a set of plans and they just start, you know, they work off what's in front of them because in essence that's what they've been hired to do, right? But uh, that's maybe not in the best interest of the project. Sure, yeah, and, and uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the project that we worked on is that we were brought in very, very early on yeah. and we were able to uh, work together and, and kind of understand some of the challenges and, and hey, we need to do this a little bit differently. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's one of the things that I really would love to see more of is is bringing your 
uh, your water shape experts in at an earlier stage because uh, so often by the time we arrive you know the slabs the foundations are in place and everything and and then it becomes a challenge yeah it's difficult to change i would like to say we've learned and you know from <laughs> each home that we finish and work with you know a, a special a specialist like yourself and uh, and then now the communication is being be is is more open and better with the contractors and their subs and then with us, and I think we're learning from each other, and we we, we work with a handful of contractors that have experience of our homes. You know, it takes a while for them to understand our style and what we like, but I think as long as we keep the communication open and then continue with the process of understanding what you need from us and what we need from you to execute this overall concept is important. And I think, uh, I think we're getting there and you know, building this continuous relationship with you, um, I think it's just gonna make their future projects and water features that we're trying, you know, we're, we're trying to come up with better and bigger and more, uh, you know, not crazy, but more um, e expansive ideas. And then, you know, you're here to help us try to make that come true. Yeah, and no, I think adding to that, our, our projects generally, we're, we're always striving for simplicity, and, and simplicity is often the most difficult thing exactly. to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to have lots of different components doing different things. It's much more difficult to try and take, say, the example of a pool, a water feature, and a, and a hot tub, and make it completely seamless so it just looks like one body of water. That's a, almost an impossible task, you know, but that's what we're striving for and trying to make you do for us. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and, and so um, I, I'm a part of a, an organization called the Society of Watershape Designers. Is uh, that like a, a house at Gryffindor or something? Or <laughs> exactly. Like Harry Potter? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it's, it's, uh, what I have enjoyed about that is that, um, you know, we we strive to make you guys look good. Uh, and, and we, we uh, like I know just enough architecture to be dangerous. Uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, so we've had to take some architecture, some drawing classes, some Great. color theory classes. Uh, uh, but then a bulk of our curriculum is based around hydraulics and mechanical systems and engineering and that. Uh, and, and I think, um, I think it is, it's allowed me to have a real holistic understanding of water. Um, now, one of the things, I don't pretend to be a designer. Um, I, I can sketch a little bit uh, to, to, to do details in the field, but I love bringing to life what you guys design and what you, what you draw and the concepts that are in your head and, and figuring out how to pull that out. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, that's, that's the most... Um, engaging thing for me and, and keeps me going. Um, I'd love to get into just a little bit more um, how you, like what, y you said you've used water to um, change the mood and to, to draw you in and to slow you down. Uh, I'm seeing so much more water integrated inside the house uh, and that's kind of a newer thing um, you know I'm really uh, the the project that we worked on um, you know that whole front entry water wall that that we couldn't end up figuring out how to to build it and from an engineering perspective but um, you know that was such an intriguing concept to me and and how do you how do you enjoy bringing water inside the house now well that's a that's a, a good question. I, I don't think we really have very much. And um, I, I think there, if water in some ways is way more problematic inside the house yes. than outside. So uh, we've kind of tended to, to stay away from that. I mean, one of the advantages, obviously, of working in such a pleasant, balmy climate is you can have the doors open all the time so you can put your water features outside and not worry about having them inside and dealing with the, the either the moisture problems or, or the... Uh, problems with odor, I guess, you know, which, which is another issue that, you know, you, you're limited, you're often using chemicals to keep that water in the inside clean. And, and you may know more about that, Dave, maybe you better share some light on us, because if there are other ways to do that, that we yeah, could start to, are. I mean, that's it might become something much more open to, mm -hmm. you know, than we have been. But even on Bel Air Road, um, though you didn't bring the water in there right. uh, we do have the wellness center uh, right down there uh, right. and that's a that's a trend that i really see growing yeah um, that's something we're seeing a lot of um and and we're seeing interesting components of that like uh 
different types of ways with like uh, water uh, like for example horizontal showers plunge pools and yeah what are the other things called that Francesco has oh, the float tanks float tanks, tanks yeah. and stuff like that happening full wellness area yeah mm -hmm. it's really a wet room that we're creating so you know if, if we're not purposely bringing in water as a water feature we're creating rooms that are going to be completely wet yeah, one of the things that I've always been intrigued with your guys' designs is is that you always, not always, but but you oftentimes have the really tall water walls that extend down into the basement space yeah. and and bringing the light down to the basement there. Uh, but yeah, even though it's not inside, uh, it's 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 definitely an element that is is viewed from the inside. So it's um, though it's still on the outside, you're utilizing it in the interior space. Yeah, very, very much. In fact, we were working with a new client right now, and and first thing they said to us is like, we really want a basement, but we don't want it to feel like a basement, mm -hmm. and that's that's something we're really striving to do. And these water features help us do that. You know, by creating these light wells, the water helps to refract the light into the basement, makes them brighter, um, gives you the reflections, and, and and looking at the water, it, it gives you the impression that it's not like a, a light well. It's really more like a space out there, and, and that helps us a lot, I think, with that feeling. Yeah, yeah, and and just bringing water within the wellness centers. In right. That. You know, you, you go to your your spas, and they almost always have, you know, a water wall or something. You get that audible, but yeah, it really it really changes the mood, and and it gives you kind of. Um, even if it's not physically cooling, uh, it, it gives you that sense of cooling down, just the, the view of water. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, anything exciting that you guys have coming up that, uh, that you're, you know, that you can share? A moat. A moat. <laughs> <laughs> but that's... <laughs> That's counter, because now you're trying to keep people out. <laughs> well, or stop think, them falling off the edge. <laughs> oh, that, yes. I think you're going to be working on a project for us where we have a pool on the roof, water feature on the main level, and then another pool in the basement mm -hmm. here in Newport. So, uh, oh, you know, yeah, that's going to be three fun. levels of water. And a harbor outside, and, too. And then a harbor exactly. on the other side of the property. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I'm real excited about that one, and and that's really fun. Uh, do you guys? How much are you working down here locally? You know, it's interesting. I mean, I I'd say Los Angeles is now really our home market, despite the fact that we live and work here. But we we'll, we'll go up and down a couple of times a week, each of us in the office. Um, we're doing uh, uh, two or three projects in Orange County right now. Um, we're also doing projects further away, though, uh, which which is interesting too. So. Uh, it's been interesting with the uh, onset of social media, particularly Instagram is very helpful mm. for us in finding clients um, because we can post some people like to look at pictures and we have a lot of nice pictures that we can post for people to look at. And we, we now have projects, um, projects in Hawaii, in different states like um, in Oregon and That's in nice. British Columbia, Nevada and up and down California. So um, that's really great. And uh, it's also just really interesting to be out of your local environment and dealing with different conditions we just finished a house in whistler which is a ski oh house. wow yeah and uh we still got a pool and a water feature in though but uh you know it's That's uh, a little tougher in, in, it's uh, a little the tougher Canadian there. environment it, it is indeed but uh, then we have the snow which is a form of water too so <laughs> there you go um no but it's just great to 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 do to do things like that and uh we're working on a project right now, which we're very excited about, which is in Thailand and central Bangkok. Wow. And it's an, it's an urban, urban large scale home and uh, designed to with, with a lot of water usage and uh, to create like a, a, almost like an entire wellness environment in the middle of the city. And so mm. it focuses on calmness and trying to introduce nature, trying to introduce water, um, though you're surrounded by skyscrapers and really you know, other in dense urban environments. So that's going to be very exciting. Now is that residential? Yeah, it's a residential, single family residence. So um, pretty large, um, but uh, it's just interesting to, th there's all the nuances of Thai culture that we have to think about, which is just a little bit different than how we, we live here. And uh, and what it's, it's fascinating, the similarities and the differences and how do we accommodate those changes? And they have a lot more staff that they use in their house. So um, that's something we've come across as well in some of the larger projects here. Sure. You know, that you deal with staff, how can you 
if a house needs a certain number of people to, to make it work, you know, much like some of those big homes on the East Coast 100 years ago, uh, how can we do it in a way that, that the people who are the owners or the guests aren't constantly aware that there are staff around them? Give the staff an opportunity to get from A to B without necessarily marching right through the center of the living room, for example. Exactly, <laughs> invading the space. Fading, so that you can feel like it's your home and feel like you have privacy, even though you're in these homes have a large amount of people who are supporting you. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting concept that I hadn't even thought about from an architectural perspective. Yeah, we do have a jellyfish room as well, of course, coming up. That's really a jellyfish room. Yeah, so it's like aquariums on three walls and a roof. And roof. Yeah, so you go into this space and the jellyfish will swim up and around and so on. So that that's a fun room. Wow. <laughs> Um, uh, one thing that I that I see a lot in pools right now that I don't notice that you guys do much of, um, and is it intentional? Um, uh, acrylic, you know, acrylic is. Uh, I, I'm still kind of. I don't know where I stand on it. I think it's in in some ways it's being overused as an element, um, and um, you know where where are you guys on that? I think. I'm kind of where you are, Rod. You know, I feel like there are, a, there are situations where it's entirely appropriate, and then people are often just using it for the sake of using it, which I, I don't really feel makes much sense. It's um, just a bolt on it. It's kind of like yeah, the new Yeah, the fat. new thing. Mm -hmm. Let's have, like, we have a pool right now that we're working on that's that we're finishing up where um, we needed to get to a lower level, so we create this this grand flight of stairs and the stairs goes under the pool so we the section where you go under the pool we made of acrylic so it's like a three-sided acrylic you know but it's like so it's almost like two pools with an acrylic section in between i think that's fun and successful because sure. there's a there's a methodology to it and you've got a journey to go through and you can as opposed to just looking at a piece of acrylic stuck on the side of a pool um, so i think it makes sense for situations like that um, I don't, and I think it can be useful as another way of transmitting light into a basement area, for example. Though, though it's often, you know, people go, "Yay, let's put an acrylic in because people swimming." But you don't realize that the pool's, you know, usually way up in the air, and the basement's way down in the bottom. So you're lucky if you get a one-foot strip that's up at the ceiling, right? You know, and that's again, somewhat pointless. You know, so um, I think. Uh, if we can find a good use and it, it creates drama and um, it seems appropriate, it's great. But um, I, I just wonder personally about the long term, you know, how how it's going to hold up over time. Yeah, viability. Yeah, if it's going to, you know, scratch or yellow or less, just become less more opaque or, you know, just we'll see, I guess. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think on that side of it, it's mature, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, Shamu Stadium. I mean, it's been oh, around true. for yeah. a long time. We haven't uh, put a whale a in the house. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. We don't believe in that. You know? Sharks. So, no, no. You have to leave the poor creatures alone. You know, <laughs> put put people in the pool. That's right. <laughs> they can swim That's around. We can pay them. That's what they're for. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything exciting in water that you guys are are trying to dabble in that you would love to be able to and haven't been able to figure out what are what are some of the things that uh that what are some of the frustrations that that water i mean you you mentioned one uh kind of the uh the smell aspect and the chemical aspect um and uh, I really feel like in the last like five years we've been able to develop that and, and take some of that away. But so, what are some of you, the limitations that you you f hold back from water uh, in your designs, and what would you love to do that you're not? I think materials, how water is associated with materials, and how we can't put certain materials next to water or in the water. Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to stop the water from, you know, touching or entering those areas where materials won't handle the water. Uh, those are the pretty much the challenges we face, is because we want water to be completely integrated with the architecture and the structure. And then when you have elements of materials that project beyond it you know, in an aesthetic view, you'd have to see how that translates. So whether it's a switch of materials or a, a barrier to prevent the water from, you know, physically touching that material. So those are uh, what we're facing today, and we're trying to find ways to, to work around that. And I think you helped us a little bit on our Bel Air job of uh, limiting our water walls to come down to an adjacent limestone piece of 
you know, wall cladding mm -hmm. and how to stop that water from completely, you know, uh, saturating that face of, of wall cladding. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes it's just a collaboration uh, and, mm -hmm. and coming together and understanding, okay, here's what, here's the limitations, here's where it's going to be. And, and um, yeah, that's, that's what I enjoy bringing to the table is, is how we can solve some of these problems. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. To, I think seamlessness in general is a good word that you touched on, mm -hmm. how to make things seamless. Mm -hmm. Connections, th those are things we worry about. For example, a pool I just described, the acrylic section. I mean, if you think it's like it's like there's a pool, there's acrylic section, there's another pool. Like, what happens when the when the ground moves? Because it does, especially here. Exactly. Um, how how is that gonna you know how is that gonna work at those connections? But I think going forward, uh, lighting is something that I think we're gonna have to think about more. I I think there's just tremendous opportunity there, and um, a lot of lighting can be, you know, either not so successful or underlit or also garish as well, and I'd like to try and see what we can do going forward to think about lighting better and make the lighting more integrated with what we're doing elsewhere on, on the homes, and that, that's something I'd really like to do. It. I think playing with water texture would be interesting too. Mm. You know, that right now we do a lot of, um, you know, you have water walls, which, you know, there's, splashing is a big issue right. we have to think about as well. It. Yeah, how do you contain splashing? But also it would be interesting to see if we could do things where water was, um, we could put still water next to moving water. And, mm. you know, how could we play with that as a new kind of concept? You know, a, a while ago I went to um, the Amazon and there's this bit where the two rivers come together, like the Amazonia and the Rio Negro, and mm -hmm. they're like the two waters come together, and one is black and one is like I've brown. Been there. It's, it's the crazy, most, isn't yes. it? You know, and you see these two water, but and the temperature is different, and you can just run your hand through it, and um, so it just made me think about, you know, how can we do something that people haven't seen with, with water, you know, like different texture, different movement, and so on. Yeah, I think we played around with that uh, on Bel Air. You yeah. know, we had the big water wall that came down, but then the challenge was we had this reflection pond right next to it right. that had to stay it had to stay you know, calm. calm. Yeah, exactly. And and you, you you have to be real intentional about yeah. uh, modifying that. Um, and the seamlessness. I mean, that's something that I'm really intrigued by as well. Um, yeah. You know, how do we create different environments? That's one of the ways I I foresee integrating acrylic. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's what we're talking about on the, the Newport job, um, where we have also this large water wall coming down um, into a swimming pool. Uh, it's not coming into a water feature. Right. And I'm proposing that we put uh, an acrylic barrier in there um, because we're going to have so much heat loss coming off of that that, that the pool needs to stay warm. And, and by running the water down the water wall, you're constantly cooling the water. Right. And so my, one of my solutions that I'm exploring with the contractor is putting an acrylic wall in there so that it reads as a single body of water when you're in the space, yet it, uh, we have the functionality uh, where we can keep the pool warm and it's not going to cost the client you know, significant amounts of money. So that's that's one of the, the things that I'm intrigued with, uh, with utilizing that medium. It's just utilizing it to create um, exactly what you're talking about. How can we make everything seem right. like it's all one, all one body, body of water? water? Yeah, that's one that new project I was just talking about. We're trying to do something where there's like a linear pool that becomes a water feature that spills down into the basement so and then becomes a water feature down below. So really it's three components. Mm. And the idea is make them read like a seamless element, but in reality they're going to be three different things, three different water temperatures, three different usages, and so on, but to get that appearance that they're all one thing. Sure. All right, well, thank you guys so thank much. You. It's thank been you. A, it's been a, a great conversation. Uh, and, and again, I'm just so honored that you guys would choose to come play with me today and, uh, <laughs> and, and get up this early morning with us. Uh, thanks for having us. We really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Steve. Ask the Masters is dedicated to educating, mentoring, and designing a better workplace for the swimming pool industry and their families. Please take a moment to share, like, and review our content with all of those that would be interested.